some of, for some of you, this is going to be difficult in the sense that I want you to, in your imaginations, to try and take yourself back to, to uh, Auckland in 1969, because um, that's the year I met uh, John Stott. I want you to imagine yourself in a typical down at heel kind of student accommodation, uh, what we used to call a flat in those days, student flatting, um, a grotty old uh, weatherboard house in the Auckland suburb of Mount Eden. Um, so that was in 1969. The occasion uh, is a by invitation only opportunity um, where um, uh, people had been invited, students uh, who weren't of the faith, uh, to come along um, to hear uh, this visiting Englishman. Um, I was one of the four guys who, who lived in that house. And at the time, I was also the chair of the organizing committee for the John Stop mission at Auckland University. So I was thrilled that we squeezed something like 40 or so students into the, into the one large room. Um, you can imagine the furnishing. If you want to imagine the furnishing, just think of those old beaten up sofas you see on the side of the footpath these days where people are doing hard rubbish collections. That was our kind of, kind of living accommodation. Um, the students uh, sat, I, I think, absolutely riveted as John explained his reasons for following Jesus. And uh, 42 years later, I can't recall the detail of what he said, but many who were gathered in that room on that occasion uh, actually responded to Jesus' call, um, including some of, some of my friends. So the Stott mission um, at Auckland University proved to be one of the most formative weeks of my life. Uh, John's very thoughtful faith and humility really impacted on me. We spent many hours together uh, in my old beat up 1937 Ford 10, if any of you can imagine what that looked like, driving from one venue to another, uh, praying together before and after each of the meetings. Some of these meetings were just small gatherings in, in, in student houses um, and in university hostels. Um, others uh, were held in university lecture theatres where John spoke to crowds of um, you know, a few hundred students. The final public meeting was a Sunday night evangelistic service in a large inner city church. And at the end of that, about 30 or so of the students at that gathering heeded John's very softly spoken urging that they respond to Jesus' love. Actually, just recently, my wife and I watched something on SBS TV here. that was a program about Billy Graham, and we saw something of his great crusades. Well, while John Stott and Billy Graham became friends, I'd have to say their style was dramatically different, where Billy Graham was almost sort of aggressive in the way he urged people to turn to Jesus, John Stott was much more quiet and softly spoken about it. During our post-mission debriefing with John, he observed that most of those people who had made the decision to become followers of Jesus were actually people already surrounded by Christian friends. And that was a critical lesson, I think, for many of us, because many of us in the what was then called the Evangelical Union were too cloistered and comfortable in our Christian subculture, enjoying Christian companionship, but in effect isolating ourselves from the broader world of the university. By the time John came to Auckland University in 1969, he was no stranger in student evangelism, having begun that strategic ministry more than 10 years earlier. And over a period of three decades or more, his passion and effectiveness in communicating the gospel to student audiences would see him invited to campuses on nearly every continent. And, and hundreds and hundreds of young women and men would come to faith through his teaching. But as I will explain more fully later, it was John Stott's extraordinary contribution to what turned out to be a lengthy process of integrating a richly holistic understanding of mission into the thinking and practice of mainstream evangelical Christians that was to have particular significance for me. John's passion for evangelism was rooted 
in a love for God and neighbor. And it was the same love that generated his wider concern for human well-being. In a moving tribute to John Stott, Peter Kuzmik, who's the founder and director of the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Croatia and a professor of world missions and European studies at Gordon Conwell in the US, he wrote these words, which I think really captured um, something really important about John Stott. Kuzmik wrote, his concern, this is John Stott's concern, for the well-being of every human being, insisting that all are made in the image of God, was obvious even in the way he treated people we met on the street or waitresses in various restaurants. John encouraged many of us to evangelize because people everywhere were lost apart from God's saving work. He himself was a passionate evangelist, fully aware of the deep consequences of human falseness, both for individuals and human communities. He strongly believed in the liberating power of the gospel and responsible freedom under the lordship of Christ. At the same time, he constantly encouraged us not to give up dreaming of a world in which hatred would be replaced by love, revenge by forgiveness, war by peace, slavery by freedom, and enmity by reconciliation. He modeled biblical Christianity. What it means to think critically live credibly and proclaim joyfully the transformative message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, 18 months after the Auckland mission, I met up with John again at an international conference in Canberra in January 1971 at ANU, host, hosted by the Australian Federation of Evangelical Students. And it was then that I personally experienced and benefited from his pastoral heart and his wisdom uh, it was a very large gathering, um, and I had hoped for an opportunity to sit and chat with him, but there were over a thousand students at this conference from Australia, New Zealand, Asia, and the Pacific. And after every one of his sessions, there always were large queues of students wanting to speak with him. And I was reluctant to add to the demands on his time, and it didn't look like I was going to get to speak with him. And then just one day during the conference, we happened to pass one another in the corridor and he stopped and he peered at me and he said, that's not Steve behind all that hair, is it? Now that might seem a strange thing to say when you look at me now. Um, but since the time we had been together in Auckland and when we, when he saw me in the corridor in Canberra, the whole long hair beard and beads thing had happened to me and not him. And, and also during that time, he had conducted several other missions and spent time with numerous people in different parts of the world. And despite that, he instantly recognized me in the corridor, long hair, beard and all, and remembered my name. I was just staggered. He immediately suggested that we should set some time to sort of catch up together, which we did shortly after in his room. And we sat and chatted and he talked about various things and two things stand out in my memory. One was that he asked after the well-being of each one of the students who had come to faith during the Auckland mission and he asked after them by name and he explained to me that he really wanted to know where they were all at because he needed to update his prayers. Everyone who knew John Stott well, much better than I ever did, tended to comment about his extraordinary life of prayer. But he was also interested in me, and he asked all sorts of uh, questions about my own well-being that I won't go into now, um, but they showed uh, that he had observed and remembered much from our earlier time and chats together. And this led him to offer some pastoral advice most of which I confess I can't remember now, but one thing I do remember very well is that he observed to me that uh, in order for us to uh, fulfill what God has in store for us, God calls some of us to live a life of celibacy. And he clearly thought that might be the case for me. And I remember saying very directly back to him, 
that I dearly hope I wasn't one such person. One of the themes that emerged clearly in many of the articles and books that have been written about John Stott since his death in 2011 was his genuine interest in and care for the people he met and shared time with. Each person mattered to him. He really cared for those with whom he worked and those whom he evangelized. And as Kuzmit noted, the people who served him in restaurants or met him on the streets, he also cared about. I want to concentrate on his immensely influential role in encouraging mainstream evangelical Christian leaders to embrace a holistic understanding and practice of mission, which he did through numerous private conversations, through his writing, and perhaps above all, through his extraordinarily strategic leadership within the Lausanne movement. But before that, just a little quick sort of uh, snapshot of his earlier life. He was born in 1929, 21. He was a son of an affluent Harley Street medical specialist. His early years were ones of classic English privilege. Nannies, prep school, uh, the famous rugby school where he became head boy, and finally Trin Trinity College, at Cambridge. His late teens and early adult years were a time of serious conflict with his father, Arnold Stott was appalled by his son's earnest intent to enter the ordained ministry and by his decision to seek exemption from military service on the grounds of pacifism. John's thinking on war and pacifism were to change in the years ahead. He remained a strong nuclear pacifist, but allowed for the option of a just war. But his definition of the latter would deleg delegitimize most wars. His definition was a just war is one fought for a righteous cause by controlled means with a reasonable expectation of success. He was ordained in December 1945. He was appointed as a curate at All Souls, London, and then rector in 1950. And his strong connection with that church was to last for several decades, a wonderfully rich partnership which freed him up to provide crucial, and as I've already said, humble and gracious leadership to evangelical Christians around the world. I never knew this until um, much later after I met him, but in 1959, he was actually appointed as a chaplain to the Queen. And according to Christopher Wright, he shepherded her, her in her faith for decades, but less well known, um, perhaps was his commitment to those who struggle on the margins of society. While he was a, still a schoolboy at rugby, his awareness and concern for those who lived rough on the streets and his anger yeah. that this was happening resulted in him setting up a society in the school called the ABC, the Association for the Benefit of the Community. Early in his curacy at All Souls, a well-established church in London CBD, in an attempt to better understand the plight of those who lived rough on the streets, he did the same for two nights. He went and stayed out on the streets, um, ate in soup kitchens and slept rough. Interestingly, I never saw him make any reference to this in any of his writing. But as I look at what he wrote, I can see that those kind of experienced influenced his thinking and his faith. His faith was one which treated with absolute seriousness the radicalism of Christ's insistence that we must not neglect God's call to be a people of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. As I doubt, no doubt you all know, he was a prolific writer. He was an outstanding expository preacher and his influence was truly global. His involvement with Lausanne, which we'll explore more fully soon, deepened a growing friendship with Billy Graham, who later described John as having unquestionably been one of the most influential individuals of the 20th century in bringing about a renewal of biblical faith throughout the world. As pastor, scholar, evangelist, theologian, and writer, 
John Stott had been used of God to touch countless lives for Christ, Billy Graham said. In April 2005, Time magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, something I'm sure would have listed a wry and perhaps somewhat embarrassed smile from the man himself. So that's a little bit of his background. In 1970, several months after the Auckland mission, John sent me a copy of his just published Christ the Controversialist. And it was only when I went back to look at that book shortly after his death in 2011 that I came to realize the extent to which it had expanded my understanding and practice of faith. Here's just one quote from that book. Still today, there are neglected groups of our human society. For example, drug addicts, alcoholics, the mentally sick and the elderly who need what might be termed total care. They challenge evangelicals to bold experiments which would combine gospel truth and practical service in a balanced expression of love. Little did I know that the following year I would become embroiled in what Stott describes as one of these bold experiments, um, one that was to profoundly impact on my faith and life and that of my future wife. In 1971, I was president of the Auckland University Evangelical Union, and along with five other EU members, I was living in the middle of the university campus. The local Anglican church had offered us a small house and a peppercorn rental in the, on the understanding that we would use it as a base for student evangelism, something we were already committed to. But on the first day together in our new home, we prayed that God would provide opportunities for us to be witnesses to his love, not only to those we studied with, but also to those who lived around us. We had absolutely no idea of the implications of that prayer. We had literally no inkling of what lay ahead as God answered it. And in no time at all, our lives became embroiled with those of several homeless people and others who inhabited our yet to be gentrified inner city neighborhood. The bold experiment to use John's words placed us on a steep and often uncomfortable learning curve. If we didn't already fully understand it, we soon learned that it was simply not enough, good enough, nowhere near adequate to talk about the love of God. Words about love minus actions of love in the context we found ourselves in are very quickly rendered empty and inconsequential. And within a week, our lives became very messy indeed and remained that way for the rest of the year we lived in that house. At the same time, entering into these new relationships and friendships led to one very distressing and disappointing discovery. We knew that as a male only household, it was not wise for us to provide accommodation to single women. But finding a local church willing to help and to find someone to accommodate uh, such women proved impossible. In retrospect, I believe that our move into a more holistic response to the needs of our new neighbors was a direct consequence of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It certainly didn't emanate from a well-informed biblical theology of mission. The missiology taught in the evangelical tradition that we were part of in that household and that I became part of when I first came to faith as a 14-year-old equated mission with proclamatory evangelism. John Stott, however, was already challenging this truncated understanding of mission. To quote again from his 1970 book, Christ the Controversialist, he writes, the kind of evangelicalism which concentrates on saving, exclusively on saving individual souls, is not true evangelicalism. It is not evangelical because it is not biblical. It forgets that God did not create souls, but body souls called human beings who are also social beings, and that he cares about their bodies and their society 
as well as about their relationship with himself and their eternal destiny. So true Christian love will care for people as people and will seek to serve them, neglecting neither the soul for the body nor the body for the soul. A few years later, Chris and I, recently married, removed to a remote town in the North Island of New Zealand to join the staff of a local high school. And it was during this time that we stumbled across a book with the intriguing title, They Can't Eat Prayer. Published in 1973, this was a brief history of a new faith-based Christian development organization that I'd never heard of called Tear Fund. At that time, Chris and I were sponsoring a child through World Vision. And for two years, I was the school's 40 hour famine organizer. But they can't eat prayer really excited me when I read it and was a major factor in my decision to accept an invitation to join the inaugural board of Tear Fund New Zealand that was just in the process of being established in 1977. And like me, the majority of the board's members were in their late 20s or early 30s. And we strongly believed that Tear Fund's emphasis should not be on fundraising, but on educating Christians with respect to the discipleship implications of global poverty and discipleship. And in this regard, we made extensive use of John Stott's little book called Walk in His Shoes, The Compassion of Jesus. And this small book published in 1979 by InterVarsity Press was published to accompany a Tear Fund UK sound strip of the same name. And if you have ever had any idea of what I mean by sound strip, then you're really showing your age. During our first year in Talmanui, I was blissfully ignorant of a major event on the other side of the world, one which John Stott was to play a, a crucial role. In July 1974, uh, nearly two and a half thousand evangelical Christian leaders accepted an invitation from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association to, to participate in the first International Congress on World Evangelization in Lausanne. The stated aim of the Congress was to develop strategies for the evangelization of the world. Roughly 50% of the delegates came from the majority world, which is an acknowledgement really of the seismic shift that was already underway in the global church. In his opening address, Billy Graham was crystal clear about his objective in initiating what was to become a gathering of considerable historical significance. Here at Lausanne, he said, let's make sure that evangelism is the one task we are unitedly determined to do. Billy Graham's exhortation needs to be understood, I think, within the context of the alarm that many evangelicals felt at that time of what they perceived as a diminishing commitment to evangelism and a growing universalism within the ecumenical wing of the global church. Present in Lausanne was a small but significant presence of a group of remarkable younger Latin American theologians and mission practitioners, and they were gripped by a somewhat different concern. Though they were fully committed to proclamatory evangelism, they passionately believed that a fully biblical understanding of the mission of the church involved a much broader response to human need, one that evangelicals were largely guilty of neglecting. And John Stott was to serve as a crucial bridge between these two poles. The planning committee for the Congress had asked John to give an opening address on the biblical basis of evangelism and to provide biblical definition of five key words, mission, evangelism, dialogue, by which they meant dialogue with people of other faiths, salvation and conversion. The address is worth a careful read, but I want to focus on a few key points that illustrate why John was able to so effectively bridge the gulf between those whose primary and often sole focus was on evangelism 
and those particularly that younger generation of leaders from Latin America, like Samuel Escobar and Rene Padilla, who were urging evangelicals to take seriously the biblical mandate to be a people of justice and compassion and engage effectively in responding to the consequences of economic poverty on the lives of so many and the causes of that poverty. In his keynote address, John stressed that mission is an activity of God arising out of the very nature of God. So the mission of the church arises from the mission of God and is to be modeled on it. And as a consequence, John argued that rather than shout the gospel at people from a distance, we need to involve ourselves deeply in their lives, to think ourselves into their problems and to feel with them in their pains. He then proceeded to urge his audience to embrace not just the great commission, but also the great commandment. What is the relation between the two, he asked. Some of us behave as if we thought them identical, so that if we shared the gospel, we have completed our responsibility to love him. But no, the great commission neither explains nor exhausts nor supersedes the great commandment. What it does is to add the command of neighbor love and neighbor service, a new and urgent Christian dimension. If we truly love our neighbor, we shall without doubt tell him the good news of Jesus. But equally, if we truly love our neighbor, we shall not stop there. I've already mentioned that one of the younger Latin American leaders present at the Congress was Rene Padilla, who at that time was the Associate General Secretary of the South American branch of the International Federation of Evangelical Students. Whoops, sorry, I've snuck ahead there. Let me go back. Um, Immediately prior to the Congress, John and Rene had spent several weeks together as Rene shepherded John to various student gatherings in Mexico, Peru, Chile, and Argentina that were organized by IFES. And he also acted as the translator for John's addresses. Rene and John were to become great lifelong friends. Rene has written about this, but I remember him telling me about how on during that trip one morning, um, he woke up early um, and he could hear this sort of brushing noise and he woke up, he and John were sharing the same room and he discovered that John was polishing Rene's shoes, which had got very muddy. <laughs> and he said that was just so typical of the kind of man that he was. One of the great joys of serving as chair of the MICA network, now called MICA Global, in his first 10 years was the opportunity it gave me to get to know and admire Rene, whom we invited to be our inaugural president. Sadly, Rene passed away on April the 27th this year, exactly 10 years to the day after the passing of his good friend, John. But a few months before John's death, Rene wrote these words to me. John Stott's friendship has been the most enriching friendship I have had in my adult life. More than anything else, I have seen in him a real portrait of Christian radical discipleship, the sort of discipleship that pleases God because it combines faithfulness to the gospel with relevance to life in the world, personal commitment to Christ with concern for people and their needs, love for God with love for one's neighbor. He and I could hardly be any farther apart from each other with regard to our socioeconomic background, but his God-given humility has made of our friendship a good illustration of true reconciliation in Jesus Christ. Well, Rene gave an address to the delegates at that 1974 Lausanne Congress, and I looked at the Lausanne Movement website just the other day and they described Rene's address as a seminal address that set the 1974 Congress alight. And it is described on that website as the speech that shook the world. I'm not sure, in fact, I know that many of those Western delegates who were at that Congress had that feeling at the time. Thankfully, things have moved on. But at the time, the boldness, strength, 
and, and force of Rene's words and his passionate critique of what he described as the export of American enculturated gospel around the world upset a great number of people. Let me just share a few extracts of what Rene had to say. When the church lets itself be squeezed into the mold of the world, it loses the capacity to see and even more to denounce the social evils in its own situation. A church that is not faithful to the gospel in all its dimensions inevitably becomes an instrument of the status quo. The gospel is meant to place the totality of life under the universal lordship of Jesus Christ, not to produce cultic sects. It is an open break with the status quo of the world. Therefore, a gospel that leaves untouched our life in the world in relationship to the world of humans, as well as in relation to the world of creation, is not the Christian gospel, but culture Christianity adjusted to the mood of the day. This kind of gospel has no teeth. It is a gospel that the free consumers of religion will want to receive because it is cheap and it demands nothing of them. Now, all these years later, it's possible that the cut and thrust of the debate regarding the holism of the gospel may seem to be something of purely historic interest and not of much immediate relevance. And that may well be the case in many contexts because I think the work of John, Rene and many others has had impact. But many of the wonderful students that I've had the privilege of working with in the Master of Transformational Development Program over the last 11 years who live and work in Asia and Africa and the Middle East have frequently shared how the work they know in their hearts is really close to God's heart is not viewed that way by many in the churches that they are part of and the pastors that, that, that they encounter. It is still seen in many places as an optional extra and not as part of the church's core business. And, and I certainly encountered that kind of attitude over and over again in the years between 1984 and 2009 when I worked at Tier Australia or Tier Fund as it is now again called. I can recall conversations with students at AFES meetings that I had been invited to speak of. One in particular comes to mind in, in Adelaide where uh, I was accused basically of, of arguing the cause of something which the student says it's nothing more than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and we should be saving people off the ship that's going down and and that was the kind of understanding of of of, of um, mission that the student had in 2002 while still at tier I had the privilege of being invited and giving a daily Bible address to a couple of hundred of expat missionaries at the UMN conference, the United Mission to Nepal conference in Kathmandu. And I remember at the conclusion of one of these, an Australian who'd been working with UMN for over 20 years came up to me and he said, he said, this is the first time I've heard someone explain so fully from the scriptures why I, what I am doing in my daily work is God's work as an, and is an integral part of God's mission. Thank you. And then, then he added that he was from Sydney by way of explanation. Well, that was in 2002. Moreover, if the old adage that the majority of Christians get their theology from the songs they sing in church rather than the sermons they hear or the Bible they read, then a, miso then a missiology and practice that truly embraces the biblical mandate to do justice and act with kindness and compassion may, will work will remain elusive. But back to the 1974 Congress, it culminated with the adoption of what was called the Lausanne Covenant. And uh, the Lausanne Movement describes John Stott as the chief architect of that covenant. It set out to articulate a set of core convictions about evangelism and the church's responsibility to evangelize, while at the same time incorporating some of the key concerns expressed by Rene and other delegates from low-income countries. It described evangelism as, quote, the proclamation of the historical biblical Christ as Savior and Lord, 
with a view to persuading people to come to him personally and to be and so be reconciled with God. But it also stressed that the result of evangelism include the results of evangelism include obedience to God, incorporation into his church, and responsible service in the world. I just need to change the slide here. It went on to affirm that God is both the creator and judge of all men. We therefore should share his concern for justice and reconciliation throughout human society and for the liberation of men and women from every kind of oppression and express penitence both for our neglect and for having sometime regarded evangelism and social concern as mutually exclusive. Although reconciliation with other people is not reconciliation with God, nor is social action evangelism, nor is political liberation salvation. Nevertheless, we affirm that evangelism and socio-political involvement are both part of our Christian duty. For both are necessary expressions of our doctrines of God and man, our love for our neighbor and our obedience to Jesus Christ. Sadly, in my opinion, for reasons I will explain later, it also argued that in the church's mission of sacrificial service, evangelism is primary. It also, also included in the covenant was this following statement. All of us are shocked by the poverty of millions and disturbed by the injustices which cause it. Those of us who live in affluent circumstances accept our duty to develop a simple lifestyle in order to contribute more generously to both relief and evangelism. I'm just going to turn on some lights here because it's getting a wee bit dark. Excuse me. John Stott later described these particular words, the ones in bold, as causing more critical comment and, and conscientious debate than any other words in the covenant. And it's possible that some of the 400 or so delegates who abstained from signing the covenant did so because of their objection to the inclusion of that sentence. And one of those who refused to sign it was Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy. The level of conscientious debate and controversy around the inclusion of the lifestyle commitment continued on well after the Congress and led to the decision to convene an international consultation on simple lifestyle in 1980 under the auspices of the Lausanne movement and what was then known as the World Evangelical Fellowship. And the co-conveners of this were John Stott and Ron Sider. Now, I was on the board of Tear Fund New Zealand at the time, and I studiously read all the papers uh, prepared for that consultation and was very grateful for the carefully crafted document that resulted from it, which was called an evangelical commitment to simple lifestyle. It was and remains a challenging document, and it certainly generated some very robust discussion within the board of Tear Fund New Zealand some of the members found it deeply disturbing. I found it powerfully relevant and persuasive. Consider this one short extract, keeping in mind that the data quoted is, of course, 40 years old. Our Christian obedience demands a simple lifestyle, irrespective of the needs of others. Nevertheless, the fact that 800 million people are destitute and that about 10,000 die of starvation every day makes any other lifestyle indefensible. While some of us have been called to live among the poor and others to open our homes to the needy, all of us are determined to develop a simpler lifestyle. We intend to re-examine our income and expenditure in order to manage on less and give away more. We lay down no rules or regulations for either ourselves or others, Yet we resolve to renounce waste and oppose extravagance in personal living, 
clothing and housing, travel and church buildings. We also accept the distinction between necessities and luxuries, creative hobbies and empty status symbols, modesty and vanity, occasional celebrations and normal routine, and between the service of God and slavery to fashion. In my third year as National Director of Tear Fund Australia, I published that statement in full in our quarterly magazine in the hope that it would impact on many others as it had impacted on me and my wife. In February 1984, uh, my wife, Chris and I moved to Melbourne, Australia with our two young children and I began my 25 years with Tear Fund Australia. And John Stott was at that time the president of Tear Fund UK. And I discovered he was coming to Australia to speak at an AFES conference um, in Melbourne. And so I wrote to him and, and this asked if he would be willing to speak at a public event uh, for Tear, uh, which he was very happy to do. On arrival um, in Sydney, he, uh, he rang me and with characteristic warmth said how much he was looking forward to renewing our fellowship because we hadn't seen one another since 1971. And then on the phone, he asked after Chris, whom he'd never met, and he expressed his hope that she would attend the meeting so that this could be remedied. Now, I don't know if Chris was planning to attend it, but when she heard about his, uh, his comment, then she made sure that she was there. And when John had finished talking to the last person in the seemingly endless queue of people who wanted time with him after his address, he looked around and he spotted Chris and he said, you have to be Chris. And he took hold of her hand and gave her his undivided attention. To quote Chris, he spoke to me with completely undivided attention. He made me feel that I really mattered to him. In that same year, I began my work at Tear. John's book, Issues Facing Christians Today, a major appraisal of contemporary social and moral questions was published. What a godsend to a young CEO of a faith-based international aid organization with a strong focus on encouraging Australian Christians to make a biblically shaped response to global poverty and injustice. I bought a copy early in 1985, once I'd become aware of it, and I devoted a full page to promoting it in the autumn 1986 issue of Tear Fund's quarterly magazine. I wrote that the book may well prove to be the most significant one written by an evangelical Christian in this decade, and that it was a book that demands a response. And I urged people to buy it, read it, act on it, and lend it or give it away. I must confess that I didn't follow my own exhortation. I still have my original copy, though I like to think I maybe lent it to one or two people. It's heavily marked, dog-eared, nearly falling apart due to heavy use. And if you haven't read it yet, please do. A fourth and fully revised and updated version of it was published in 2006. But let me share just a few quotes from that book as it was in 1985. There is a constant trend tendency in the church to trivialize the nature of salvation as if it meant no more than self-reformation or the forgiveness of our sins or a personal passport to paradise or a private mystical experience without social or moral consequences. It is urgent that we recover the doctrine in its biblical fullness. Well, here's another quote. In the light of these biblical truths and of the contemporary destitution of millions, it is not possible for affluent Christians to stay rich in the sense of not accepting any modification of economic lifestyle. We cannot maintain a good life of extravagance and a good conscience simultaneously. One or the other has to be sacrificed. Either we keep our conscience and rescue our affluence, or we keep our affluence and smother our conscience. We have to choose between God and mammon. And one more extract. These two doctrines regarding the beginning and end of history 
the creation and the consummation have a profound effect on our perspective. They give us a respect for the earth, indeed for the whole material creation, since God both made it and will remake it. In consequence, we learn to think and, and, and act ecologically. We repent of extravagance, pollution, and wanton destruction. At the root of the ecological crisis is human greed. Now, John was writing these words in this way long before I saw anything being published about creation care. Now, since the publication of the first edition of the book, there has, of course, been a terrible and frightening intensification of the ecological crisis. At the time he wrote that book, very few outside a narrow circle of climate scientists had much, if any, awareness of climate change. Dave Bookless, director of, the theology, director of theology for Arosha International, has written a respectful and helpful critique of the relevant section in John's book for the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, which incidentally was another of John's initiatives. So if you go to that uh, organization's website, you can see um, Bookless's critique. But before finishing, I want to briefly return to the Lausanne Covenant's assertion on the primacy of evangelism, which I believe implicitly relegates all the other expressions of mission to a secondary status and therefore potentially making them optional or even worse, removing them from the church's job description. Despite his championing of a much broader defin of mission, definition of mission, John unequivocally endorsed the Lausanne Covenant's assertion of the primacy of evangelism. And in his 1975 book, Christian Mission in the Modern World, he added uh, this explanation. Anything that undermines human dignity should be an offense to us. But is anything so destructive of human dignity as alienation from God through ignorance or rejection of the gospel? Forty years later, Christopher Wright was commissioned to produce an updated and expanded edition of John's book. Um, Christopher had worked very closely with John over many years, so he was exactly the right person for this particular project. And the expansion came in a series of beautifully respectful responses by, by Wright to each of John's chapters. I find Wright's comments on the question of the primacy of evangelism both insightful and helpful. And Roland tells me this is a very old photo of Christopher, so forgive me for that. Christopher Wright writes, I myself would prefer, this is rather than speak of the primacy of evangelism, to speak of the centrality of the gospel. One might say that for Stott, it was the centrality of the gospel that generated the primacy of evangelism. Whereas for me, the centrality of the gospel generates the ultimacy and necessity of evangelism within an integrated understanding of mission as a whole. This kind of centrality is not such as makes everything else more peripheral, marginal and unimportant, but rather the centrality around which everything else is integrated, held together and given direction and meaning. Now, I've quoted that in length because for years I've tried to express that and I haven't managed to do so so effectively as Christopher has, does in that chapter. I want to finish with some words spoken by Ruth Padilla de Borst, one of Rene's daughters, in a pre-recorded video that was played at a special service of celebration on the 10th anniversary of John's passing. I mean, this is a... It's, 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 I don't know quite what the word I'm looking for is, but the fact that that was played on the day that Ruth's father passed away is, is quite amazing. She said of John, his humble and respectful friendship with people from outside his inherited and privileged condition led him to affirm their voice, submit to their influence and promote their agency. John Stott allowed their perspectives to broaden his in a growing friendship nurtured in several trips to Latin America, which included witnessing poverty firsthand. She also noted 
Uncle John was not around to face the current pandemic, but he did grapple with issues of injustice and climate change and teach about the biblical imperative of caring for God's world out of love for its creator. No remembrance of John Stott is complete that does not mention that concern. John Stott began each morning with a prayer I'm going to share with you. Its content in so many ways epitomizes who he was and what he believed. And it's a prayer that I've endeavored to use every morning since I discovered it. And let me just go to that prayer now. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I worship you as the creator and sustainer of the universe. Lord Jesus, I worship you, Savior and Lord of the world. Holy Spirit, I worship you, sanctifier of the people of God. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that I may live this day in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, three persons in one God, have mercy on me. Amen. And with that, I will finish. And over to you, Paul. Well, Steve, we've, uh, we've had a very rich, rich, rich uh, wine today. Bit of a foretaste of the uh, heavenly banquet. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I've got one question that's come up on the uh, the uh, uh, chat uh, box, and uh, it, it really follows on it almost exactly from where you finished. So I think that's a good place to start. So there's a question asking, could you share a little bit more insight into John's prayer life? Uh, um, it um, it uh, was something that really forgot to uh, hold of someone's interest. Yeah. I can't share anything in the detail except um, my own personal experience of praying with him as a young student in that in that beat up old um, 1937 410 was it, it had the impact of on me of making me feel as though I was already in heaven you know, that, I, that I was with someone who was just talking so um, freely and and intimately with God um, uh, and so naturally, and, and that's that's how it impacted on me. Um, I remember a story from George Hoffman, who was the uh, the, the founding director of Tear Fund in the UK, and he told a story about um, traveling with John Stott and and sharing a room with John Stott as they were traveling around, presumably when John Stott was president of Tear Fund, and he said every night John Stott would kneel by his prayer bed praying. And so George Hoffman thought, well, gosh, perhaps I better do that as well. So he would kneel by his bread praying. And he said, and he said, and I didn't want um, John Stott to think I was, you know, kind of not a man of prayer. So as long as John was praying, I'd keep praying. And then he said, on this particular night, he said, in the end, I just couldn't, couldn't pray any longer. I was just exhausted. And so he said, I quietly got up and crept into bed and looked over at John to discover he was already in bed and fast asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but people who knew him say that he 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 started early every morning. He was one of these people who would get up, you know, five o'clock in the morning and devote a significant time to prayer. And and when he was asked towards the end of his life, if there was anything he would change about how he lived his life, he said, I would have spent more time in prayer. So I guess that leaves me feeling very much something of a prayer pygmy. So thank you for that. Um, I know my picture's missing. I just can't work out how to make it reappear. So you'll just have to have me in the black there. <laughs> uh, as I was 
thinking about the asking you that question, uh, it also appear, appeared to me that um, um, he lived through the time of the charismatic renewal in the church. And um, was there, did you detect much of a sense of his engagement with that and his, his own perhaps evolution in a theology of the spirit? That's not something I ever discussed with him, and it's not something um, which I've read a great deal about in his writings. Um, I'm trying to remember of one of the, the leading charismatics in the Anglican Church in the days uh, when John Stott was, was rector at All Souls. Was it Michael Harper? Was that his name? I think something like that. And I, I, and I think um, uh, John Stott didn't share um, uh, um, the the uh, emphasis on on and certain of the sort of um, you know speaking in tongues or the need for a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I know he didn't agree with with such theology, um, but I'm 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 you know I'm not I, I haven't studied the sort of discussions or debates that he had with such people. What I do know is that he was always respectful in all his all his discussions and and. Um, and and debates with those who saw things differently from him. Great. So look, I think we could probably just freely ask questions. If you could unmute yourself, identify yourself and ask a question if there's a, another question people would like. Perhaps uh, someone sent in a question here. Uh, what do you think he would say about those many evangelicals who supported Trump? <laughs> I think he would have been utterly and absolutely horrified. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, that that kind of even I well, he would not consider those people as evangelicals mm -hmm. um, because he defined evangelicals as those who who earnestly sought to live their lives in alignment with the teaching of scripture. Um, so I, 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 I know, and I'm, I'm sure he would have been as horrified by the kind of stuff that we've been seeing happening uh, amongst certain sort of evangelicals and fundamentalists in the U S in support of Trump as, as, as we all would be. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, uh, Steve, um, um, I imagine that, well, I, I think a lot of what John was calling for would um, would still be offensive in among a lot of evangelicals now. And I was just wondering whether you had any insights from the way in which he engaged with people who, who were strongly opposed to what he was calling for. Um, yeah, is there any sort, of, any sort of insights as to the way that he engaged with them or, or maybe whether examples where you've seen where you've seen or heard of people changing their minds through the way that he engages them on that issue does that make sense um yeah it makes it makes sense um I, I, the, the, only what i've already shared really clint in terms of 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 um the way in which he listened hard to what people were saying um, time and time again in the in the uh, testimonies I've read of people who who were working with him in, in various things with respect to Lasan was was he had he had this deep he had this ability to listen very very deeply um, and respectfully and that didn't mean he he would then automatically agree with he wasn't someone who was going to agree for the sake of keeping the peace. Um, but he would listen and he would take it on board and if necessary he would modify his own thinking and and um, you know there, there are some who who have talked about what they see as as a significant evolution in his own conversion to integral mission um, to use the um, the language that we had in the within the mica network yeah. um, but the thing that struck, struck me as I read back over his, some of his earlier work, as I've shared with you, is I think uh, the commitment to integral mission you can see already in his very early writings. 
Thank you. Anyone else? So Steve, uh, as I came to today, I, I remembered, I think I remember this was a, a quote from John Stott that we should read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And um, so... That's Karl Barth. Yeah, I was just going to say, if he, if he was, he was plagiarising Karl Barth. Yeah, well, he was probably <laughs> plagiarising Karl Barth. I think he was, he was probably quoting and, and encouraging us to sort of think like that. But... Um, there's been a sort of decline in the quality of newspapers, hasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. I would say uh, read the Bible in one hand and the Saturday in the other hand <laughs> yeah. to show my political colours when it comes to the media. Mm. Yeah. But it, um, it does make it uh, challenging for Christians to sort of have a, a clear sense of what's really going on in our world and try to bring the gospel and the Christian story to that uh, reality, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, and I guess we're all in danger of, of, of restricting ourselves to our own particular media bubbles. Excuse me. So um, I, I ended my subscription to The Age a um, couple of years ago because I felt it, The Age um, was described to me when we first arrived in Melbourne as a Marxist rag. <laughs> one of our neighbours, um, but it certainly moved a, a long way from being that uh, under its current sort of um, ownership. Um, but yeah, it's hard. To, it, you have to work harder, it seems, to try and get uh, good diversity of well-thought-out opinion in reading in the media. Yeah. So Alvin Lim has asked this question. How do evangelical political leaders or church leaders respond in pandemic times? Mm. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, I think the answer to that question is probably going to have to be very contextual, determined, determined by the sort of the context those evangelicals are having to sort of uh, re Respond, and I mean, I've been I've been very distressed by the politicisation of the sort of uh, responses to the pandemic in here in Australia, and I think that's probably been fairly fairly common. I mean, I'd love to hear what other people have 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 to have to say say to that. Um, uh, well, there's an invitation. Would anyone like to say think with John Stott's hat on about this problem? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't have the quotes in front of me, but in various places, I know John Stott urged people to sort of, um, to, uh, to, to get involved in the political processes, to not to be frightened of getting involved in politics, yeah. um, in the in the sense of, of of being an advocate for just causes and for the right responses to be made to significant situations, um, and and and. Um, he argued against those who said we should keep, you know, church, the, the God, you know, the gospel separate from politics. He saw the he saw the Bible as as a de deeply political document in terms of its commit, you know, the, the strong um, uh, framework it provides for an urging to live life um, with justice and compassion. So Margaret Loy's added a question that follows on from what you just said. Was there a follow-up on the evangelical commitment to a simple lifestyle? And what is the contemporary discussion on this? Um, I haven't seen a follow-up to it, Margaret. I think it'd be great to, to see one come out. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there's, I, I'm not aware of of um, anything particular. It'd be interesting to go back to look at the the the, the, the mo and I meant to do this um, and 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 ran out of time. But the the Cape Town um, statement, you know, from Lasan, picked up on a lot of language of integral mission, and you can see Chris Wrights uh, was the the chief architect of that, and they took into into that uh, the Cape Town statement some of the wording out of the Micah Declaration on integral mission. 
Um, but it would be interesting to see if they picked up on the simple lifestyle language at all, and I have to go back and have a look at it. Um, and I can't recall. Um, but it was very interesting to me as, as a younger Christian when it first came out, how the level of resistance to that statement within some of the older members of the tier board in New Zealand. There weren't many older members. We were mostly young ones. But I can remember we had a... Um, uh, we had a we had, we ran a, 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 a day long workshop on simple lifestyle. This is the TF on New Zealand, and one of our board members was so angry about it and what came out of it that he hopped into his new BMW and drove out of the car park straight into the back of one of Auckland's buses. <laughs> and, and I have to confess, uh, the response of some of our the younger members, including me on the board, was less than gracious. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, and interestingly, in our church that we were part of then, um, uh, we, we circulated that statement and we used it uh, as a basis for some studies um, alongside um, our study of Sider's book, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. And, and the group of us that were there, we developed our own covenant to one another to live more simply. And, and, and we did that, and, the, and part of the deal was the extra funds that we created by living more simply, we were put into a special account over and above what we were giving to the church, but it was an account that would be managed by the church, and we called it the Zacchaeus Fund, um, thinking that Zacchaeus had this kind of change of life experience, and, and coming out of that Zacchaeus Fund, with, uh, one, we decided that that I think it was 70% of it would be channeled to uh, programs uh, responding to the needs of the poor in, in the global south, or, um, and the rest we would use to respond to people living in the margins within our own community, and we discovered we didn't know those people. And so by creating the Zacchaeus Fund, we forced ourselves to get engaged with people in our own local community who were doing it tough, which was an unexpected consequence of setting up the Zacchaeus Fund. And it came out of our deliberations over the evangelical commitment to simple lifestyle. Steve, I don't know whether you're starting to feel the pinch speaking for over an hour, but there are two more questions have popped up. They keep coming. Um, one is I'd be interested to hear your perspective on the lessening numbers of Christians going into mission. And the second question, what do you think John would think of the current Australian Christian leadership? Yeah. In response to the first question, I think that there is possibly a creeping universalism coming in within many evangelical church contexts as well, and some uh, hesitancy um, and uh, around the um, the uniqueness of Christ as, as, as a doorway to salvation. Uh, I think that's possibly part of, of the, one of the ways in which I would answer, to, answer that question. Um, I think also maybe there's a growing recognition that, that uh, the days of, uh, where there may be some necessity for us to be traveling somewhere else to be involved in mission are disappearing. Um, that the church is actually stronger in the global south. And of course, we are beginning to see uh, our societies as being on the receiving end of missionaries, people coming here to share the faith. So that, that would be a couple of sort of off the top of the head responses to that question. What do you think John would think of the current Christian leadership in Australia? Well, I mean, that's a hard question to answer in the sense that, I mean, he would think, he would think differently of the different Christian leaders, I, I, I imagine. I mean, there would be some Christian leaders I, I think he would want to part company with. I don't, I, yeah, um, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. Um, uh, All right. Well, um, we've put a lot of words out there today, and they've been wonderful words. And thank you very much, Steve. I think Ross has got a thank you slide to, to share with us shortly. Um, 
Irene's put up a clap. <laughs> so if you're in an audience, there'd be a bit of a response, a bit of a clap. Um, and uh, I think I've, 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 I've picked that this would be a challenging stretching experience. And I think we could all agree it has been, hasn't it? It's been a wonderful time that we've had with Steve this evening. Um, Theology on Tap has its own YouTube channel it's called Theology on Tap Brisbane. So there's the capacity to get others to come along and look at today's presentation. And there are events dating back to May last year that we've been um, recording and putting up onto our YouTube channel uh, since that time. For those of us who've joined us from outside of Brisbane or outside of Queensland, Theology on Tap's been going for over six years now. And uh, we've got uh, two books that uh, we've recently published this year. So Irene Alexander, who's, who's there on the screen, has been one of the editors with Chris Brown of this book, To Whom Shall We Go? And it's a, a, a sort of faith responses in a time of crisis book about Christian spirituality. And there is another book called Pub Theology. And um, well, oh, this book says it's available for me, but it uh, could, can also, I think both books are available through Amazon, as far as I know. So um, they, they can be available on Kindle as well. So there's all those sorts of options these days. Paul, that first book that you referred to there, I got an email from Whip and Stock about that. Yep. And um, they very kindly sent me a PDF. They weren't going to send me a book to review, but they sent me <laughs> a PDF um, so that I could have a look at it. And that, I think it looks absolutely fascinating and will certainly be recommending our library gets it at the, uh, the college. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's published now. We've, we've tried to launch it twice and twice shutdowns closed the launches. <laughs> so that's probably one of the ironies here. Um, so next month, we'll, Irene and uh, um, um, Terry Gatfield are going to share content from their chapters um, at, a, at a, a live event at the uh, Lord Stanley Hotel at East Brisbane from 4 p.m. That'll be on the 5th of September. And then on the 3rd of October, Johanna Lynch will um, will look at, um, she's describing this talk as pattern recognition, but she's she's done a PhD in, in, in safe places, places of safety um, in our own uh, lives. And uh, I think that should be quite a, a compelling uh, presentation Joanna makes. So uh, they'll be up on YouTube if you're from, out of Brisbane and you can look at them down the track. And uh, I think we've really been wonderfully blessed today. And I'd really like to thank Steve. We usually give a card and a bit of a thank you gift. That'll come in the mail, Steve. <laughs> and uh, so thank you very, very much for everybody joining in today and, and sharing in this wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.